Alright, picking up where we left off. What the C programming language calls quote unquote file copying file copying in section one point five one is more like character copying. The pseudocode says read a character. Well character is not in the file indicator, output the character just read, and then read another character. So if we implement that, we can go and nab that little example for the in key right here and it was for oh that's right I gotta do that copy escape and then paste that in it's not control V and then shift tab highlight and shift tab to dent that okay so this right here shift f5 just will do an infinite empty loop until character 27 is read which is generated by pressing the escape key so we can open up that empty loop here and we can tell it to print the character read so in order to print it we're gonna have to come down here and steal this code Cut that out. Or actually, we'll have to we're gonna call it K. So K for like key. And if you want to know if a variable name's taken, you can just type it in at F1. And it's like okay, key's taken. So we obviously shouldn't use that. So K will get the in key string, which is I think a buffer on IBM up to 15 characters and then we'll print it. So what we're doing is we're just getting that character and we're printing it. It seems pretty mundane, but that's something that has to happen on some level for that to occur. It doesn't just happen on a computer necessarily. So we're getting the key, we're printing it, and then we're checking it, and we're gonna loop until, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to loop until that key is the character equivalent of 27, the escape key. Shift F5, and then what did I do wrong here? K string equals in key. Print it. Do loop until it equals 27. Oh yeah, that's right. I always forget this one. You got to put a semicolon right there so that it doesn't print a new line. Because if we go back and look, I don't know if the frame rate's high enough, but you can see like characters whizzing by on there. So anyway, if I put a semicolon right here, then it will tell it just print the next character. Excuse me, I'm just getting over being sick. Print the next character right after the last character. So Shift F5 and then Hello. And then you could even press the return key and come down to this line. So anyway, and then we'll hit escape. Well, the C programming book specifically says to read the input so we get an end of file signal. So if we go into help and the contents, then there's this quick reference for the ASCII character codes. It's American standard for communication, information, interchange or something. Um, this is basically what most communications used, Western communications, up until close to this century. And there was just 8-bit character codes. Anyway, you can see 27 is equal to the escape key, and there actually is a printable character there. Um, according to the bare ASCII standard, it's, these characters aren't included. They're part of like the IBM MS-DOS PC extension things. So anyway, 27 is escape, and we can see right here 26 is end of file. Some people confuse it for uh, number 4, which is the end of transmission, which some documentation will say seeking an end of file, but you have to hit Control D. Control D is the end of transmission. Control Z is typically the EOF. Anyway, so we can change this from, instead of escape, we can change it to character 26 which should be the equivalent of that end of file character. And then we'll pit 
better instructions right here and say press control Z. So now we can type stuff and then we hit uh, escape doesn't work anymore, control D won't work, but control Z will. So let's one up it. Let's make it, since we were grabbing each character, um, oops, since we're grabbing each character, we can uh, slide in a little set color call right here. And this will be our own little function. And we'll just say, hit Alt E to get this menu and then go, um, just be a sub because we don't want to return a value. And it's going to be called set color. And so in set color, we're going to create a static variable called CLR. And static basically says that like that's the in static is the storage duration so normally in a function or a sub call like you use a variable it gets thrown away and then it sort of gets like reinitialized the next time that you run that sub or function well if you say static you're saying remember the value of this between calls so it's effectively created once and then that value is preserved so in some ways it's like the duration, I don't want to say it's global because it's not global and that's the whole point is that you're keeping this, you're avoiding using a global variable <clears throat> because otherwise to preserve the value in a more generic setting you would have to create a global variable. So this is saying this, this variable is only accessible within this subfunction under this name but we still will preserve it. So when you see static that refers to the storage duration. And then what we're going to do is call the built-in color function. We're going to pass it that CLR value, which should be zero when it's first initialized. And then after we change the color to zero, which will be black, and then so on and so forth, it will cycle through each call. We're going to say, we're going to increment it by one. So then the next time it will be like white or yellow or whatever the colors are in what, that order. And it only goes up to 15. So we need to make sure and say if it's if this number goes above 15 then set it back down to zero and this introduces the the if then else clause <coughs> excuse me the if then else clause so which i'm surprised i mean even in the c programming book it still hasn't covered that yet i would have thought they would have covered it before loops maybe but anyway it's kind of like the condition in a loop this is just if you want a condition without a loop. So you're saying if CLR equals 15, then um, some people will bring it down and go like that. That's actually the more typical way to do it. And then you could say else. Otherwise, you know, um, we're, we want to do nothing, actually. So I'll just put a comment there. But since we want to do nothing, and if you do the, that to close it out, you need to do an end if. But um, since we don't want to we don't care about doing nothing it will just automatically do nothing so we can do that but we want to might as well just stuff it on one line because no reason to use up the extra line alright so running back through that real quick it's a set color sub sub procedure and the very first time it's basically gonna call this and then it's gonna ignore it and preserve the value of this new variable that starts at zero um, we could even like maybe explicitly set it to zero, but to keep it simple in more advanced real world programming, you would want to be more explicit most times. And then this is a built in function color and we're passing it that value initially zero and then we're incrementing it by one, which won't do anything until the next iteration through. And then after we increment it by one, if it's beyond 15, we're going to go ahead and reset it back down to zero. And then this in sub, we should be able to hit F2 and go back to the main one. That should drop us out, you know, we'll call set color, run all that stuff, and then drop us out right here on print, and then print it. So let's go ahead and run it. And then this is in color. So it's cycling through all the colors, but if you notice, I'll hit backspace to produce the blocks. There, we're not getting, like, there's two browns already on the screen, and there's not, you know, 15 colors in between those browns. What's going on? Like, like if I wait a second in between each tap... Right there, I'm getting like two on a color. So, anyway, what's going on? That's the keyboard buffer in effect, and the way that we're pulling it, Control Z. Um, 
what it's doing is this do loop right here is endlessly just it's cycling and basically every time we pull it if we haven't pressed a key there's going to be a null which is an empty string it's just like that like empty string like that and so it doesn't print it doesn't take up any space or anything it tries to but it doesn't but it still changes the color on that cycle so that's what's going on there so if we put a little condition down here and say or actually up here let's get rid of this and we'll just say if the uh, the key is not equal to a blank, basically a null, then call that set color function. So we'll only call it if we type in a character. So it will only increment the color when we type one. Let's go ahead and shift F5. So you can see it started on, um, let's get it back to where, okay, white should be the last one. So I'm going to hit enter. And then I'll do a zero, and this should be black. Hmm. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, then zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Zero. One, two, three, four, five. Zero. Okay, so see how you can't see the zeros because they have the black background. So I'm going to hit Control Z. And then we'll do a special case for if it's zero, then we want to set the background different. So we'll go into our function. I don't know if highlighting it and hit F2. No. Okay. So we'll go in here and we'll go in between. So we can blast out another if statement in here. And we can say if color is zero, then go ahead and put a background color, appropriate background color behind it. So we'll say seven. And otherwise, which will be the case when it's not zero, we'll go ahead and do the color the color and we'll just do the black background and then we'll do the end if so this is the block style if right there and that's basically a really simple way to accomplish that so now if we run it whenever it's that zero that we normally can't see we should be able to see it so I'm gonna hit zero there it is and then one two three four oh, six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen and I'll hit eight and you can see it's still the zero color but it's just echoing the characters. And then we can just hold backspace and cycle through them. So that's that. That's basically what you're doing is copying one character at a time. And that's just one of many things you can do. You probably, I'm not a big fan of the saying, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? But if, because elephants are actually king of the jungles, they drink before the lions, by the way, and they're vegetarian animal. Um, but anyway, how do you attack a large problem the same way you attack a small one, the same way you eat a mouse one bite at a time, you know? So anyway, that's literally what we're doing here. We're grabbing each bite, each character bite, and we're doing this. And that's what you do when you copy files and whatnot. You take in a certain amount of bytes and you do something with them, compress them, don't compress them, uncompress them, change their colors, whatever you want to do. That's like, it's a fundamental element of what's going on behind the scenes with a lot of computer processing. Even if you're using higher level functions that like, if you have like a file copy function, it's doing this under the hood. And if you don't have a file copy function, then you're going to have to implement something that includes this under the hood.